Live With Lee, and this is my October wrap up. That was really disturbing, but you know what? That was my sixth time trying to record this intro, and you would think it's the easiest part, but it's just gonna be that kind of day. I'm recording this on Halloween. It's spooky. I'm naturally very scary. I am the clown that haunts my husband every day. Off to a positive start as always. Okay, anyways, before we get into my monthly wrap up, if you could be so kind to subscribe, like, maybe leave a little comment, maybe tell me what your flop and bop of the month were, maybe tell me what your deserted island books are, maybe tell me the juiciest tea that you heard this week, no face, no case, drop it below, I love to hear from y'all. And I'm super excited because I hit 400 subscribers, I am so grateful for all of you who take the time out of your day to listen to little me talk in circles. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's get into it. All right, so this month I read It Doesn't Fucking Matter How Many Books I Read. The number is unimportant. I do these wrap-ups to share with you what I liked and what I didn't like, and hopefully you can find a book that you're interested in and add it to your never-ending TBR pile. This is not me humble bragging about how many books I read, because if I wanted to do that, I would just throw up one of those reading trackers with no stars, no comments, nothing, just covers of books. Was that a little shady? Perhaps, but once again, it's Halloween. I don't know what that means, but I'm going with that excuse. All right, let's get into the arts that I read. <sighs> Lisa, let's talk. Let's talk because I ride for you. I tell everybody and their mom to read Live to Tell. So why do you want to hurt my feelings so much? This one felt like a personal attack against me because respectfully, no. I was almost waiting for Ashton Kutcher to just jump out and say you've been punked because it has to be a joke, right? Right? So this is the third book in the Frankie Elkin series. Of course, I have not read books one and two, but this one can definitely be read as a standalone. Frankie is a recovering alcoholic who finds missing persons for free. And she makes it seem like a noble thing. But to be honest, I, I think it's she doesn't really have a choice because even though she didn't get paid to find this person, I would still request a refund from her. Like she would have to pay me to go and find my missing child because stay the fuck away from me. Discretion? She's never heard of it. Tact? What's that? Might as well be Mandarin to her. She goes around and tells everybody, hey, I'm here on a secret mission. I'm trying to find Leah. Have you seen her? I heard she's banging this old man. Blah, 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 blah. Shh. Frankie? From one person who can't shut the fuck up to the other? Shh. Please, just read. The writing? Abysmal. The plot? I don't even know why Frankie was involved, to be honest. The ending? I mean, thankfully we're done, but also like, I wish I had never started. I gave it two stars, but that was extremely generous. You can't expect me to take a book seriously when your grand plan to lure out a hardened serial killer death row inmate escapee is to lure them with a bowl of spaghetti. Is this a cozy mystery? Is there a cat dressed up as a detective with a monocle on the cover of this? No. So why the fuck are we using spaghetti to lure out hardened death row inmate escapees? And then for the undercover FBI agent to be like, wow, great idea. Sir, you're fired. You're fired. You're fired. You're voted off the island. Actually, we don't even need you back on the mainland. So why don't you just stay here and investigate the crime of your fucking stupidity? Because what kind of nonsense is this? Even my chunky ass couldn't be lured out by spaghetti. And I'll pretty much do anything for a carbohydrate. Make it a flame in y'all and then we'll talk. I didn't come up with the most elaborate escape and revenge plan of all time for me to give it all up over spaghetti. Spaghetti, spaghetti, spaghetti. Oh my God, and another cringe moment with Frankie was when she put the bowl of spaghetti out and then to prove that it wasn't poison, she took a bite of it and then she went, it's honestly hard to say a lot. And when I told my husband this, it took me a couple of tries because I had second, third and fourth hand embarrassment listening to myself repeat what I had just read. So brace yourself guys. She said, um, sorry, I just got a little nauseous thinking about it. She said, Look, ma, no poison. 
Like, look ma, no hands. Look ma, no poison. Now, I don't agree with banning books, but this kind of made me reconsider a bit. I won't lie to you because what the fuck is that? And Frankie is like early 40s. That's why I'm saying this whole book is a piss take. Look ma, two stars. Should have been one. I don't know, I was in a giving mood and I tossed it a little extra one, but really like, let's keep it a stack. That's one star behavior. So yeah, that's gonna be a no from me, dog. And instead you should just read Live to Tell. Next, kids run the show, but I'm not even gonna bother with that French last name there. I was really excited when I saw this pop up on NetGalley because if you watch my five star video and if you haven't, then you definitely should. But if you watch my five star video, the loyalties was featured on there, but this is a totally different vibe than the loyalties. Would I recommend it? Maybe for like a small group of people. This is being categorized as a a thriller mystery? No. I mean, at the very bare bones, yes, it is about a detective named Clara who's investigating the disappearance of Kimmy, a famous YouTube child. <laughs> I feel like there's a better way to say that, but my brain, it's just not firing. Anyways, to me, this is more of an exploration of how people will do anything for clout, including pimping out their children. There's really nothing thrilling going on here. It's a lot of inner monologue between Clara and Melanie, who is the mother of the missing child, Kimmy. I think this would be a great book if you're not chronically online like I am. I didn't really find anything to be too profound. I thought that the legal aspects, what they're trying to do in France, were interesting. But other than that, it's pretty like, yeah, we all know. That last 30% though, keep it in the drafts. It literally read like a second book that was written by John Mars. It just also got really lost in the sauce and was going full boomer energy there. Like Clara, if you don't like social media, you don't gotta be on the gram. But don't deny that the internet has not helped your job as a detective tenfold. Don't be talking about, I wanna live in a cabin, just get off Instagram. That just seems like a simpler and quite frankly, a less expensive venture. All right, next, everyone here, everyone, no, no, that was not even close. <laughs> Everyone who can forgive me is dead. Thank you to my OG friend Carly for this rec. She gave it five stars. Unfortunately, it wasn't a banger for me, but I definitely recommend it to others. I think that this is your standard thriller fare with a little bit of jokey jokes sprinkled in. That twist at 50% did have me shook up. Gen Z's, ignore that. I know y'all told me that shook died three years ago, but I'm still in the denial phase of the grieving process, so just let me be. And before I went on this tangent, I should have told you what it was about. Essentially, this follows whatever the fuck her name is. Charlotte, who escaped a brutal attack while she was doing her master's degree in journalism. She's reinvented herself since, but old dogs cannot lie. No, that's not the right one. But anyways, then she hears that a movie is being made about that fateful night and she starts shaking like a stripper because she's got secrets. Also, I was just tired of Charlotte being crunk all the time. Like just Put the zannies and the wine down and focus, okay? It's quite literally a do or die situation for you, so you need your wits about you. Stop taking down bags of barefoot rosé. Just chill. Next is The Glass Woman. Would I recommend it? Mm, I don't know, because I'm not really sure if I got it. And also I'm not a regular sci-fi reader, so my expectations of the genre are non-existent. Like I don't really know what to expect. If you're the type of person who needs lots of technical details to explain why this is happening or how this happened or whatever, then this is not gonna work for you because it's extremely high level. It's described as Black Mirror meets Before I Go to Sleep. I've only watched two episodes of Black Mirror and one of them was that episode where that prime minister has sex with a pig. Y'all, y'all some freak nasties for that. So I don't really know if it is Black Mirror-esque, but it definitely does have the before you go to sleep vibes. It's about a woman who wakes up from an experimental procedure where they have put an AI chip into her brain. Again, it doesn't explain how that works. And she wakes up and then she's like, who the fuck are you? And he's like, I'm your husband. And then she's like, doubt it. And confusion ensues. It definitely had a lot of intrigue for me. It was written in a way that was intentional I hope intentionally confusing it keeps you guessing the entire time it's not as predictable as you would think at least not to me would you want an AI chip embedded in your brain and my answer is absolutely the fuck not I refuse to use chat GPT because 
as a writer of sort, somebody with a journalism degree, I think that ChatGPT is quite literally the nail in the coffin for journalism. And it's also the hammer that's banging the nail into the coffin and the person holding the hammer. You get what I'm saying? Not like me not using it will have any impact, but that's just a, a, a boundary, a line that I draw in the sand. I actually don't even think that AI could get a grasp on my thoughts. It would be like no amount of machine learning is going to help me understand her next move because I don't even understand my next move. So good luck to you. Okay, and then my last arc, that is a crazy face. My last arc is The Fury. I quite literally screamed when I got this in the mail. If I commented under your TikTok of you talking about this book saying that I was gonna rob you, it was clearly a joke, but Keep your doors locked. I had the pleasure of buddy reading. Yes, that's right. I actually did go through with a buddy read. I buddy read this with Lacey. Thank you so much, Lacey. It was super fun. I think I'm gonna make a longer video reviewing his backlist. So the Fury, the Silent Patient, and the Maidens. So I might keep this one a little short. Essentially, if you're looking for the Silent Patient 2.0, keep looking because this is a totally different vibe. Other than the major spoilers in the epilogue for the other two books, just big fat FYI on that one. This felt like it was written by somebody entirely different. This is sort of Agatha Christie's and then there was none but on a Greek island. Elliot and his rich ass friends go to spend an Easter weekend on this Greek island. And even though Jesus has risen, unfortunately one of them has fallen. Elliot Chase is is the main narrator and he breaks the fourth wall. It's giving me Nick Carraway vibes from The Great Gatsby, but more pretentious, which is saying a lot. Anyways, did I like it? I think so. The ending really ramps up and there's like twists on twists on twists on twists. And I've read a lot of reviews saying, oh, it's over dramatic, it's over the top. And I do agree. And I'm certainly the type of person who likes things as under the top or just plain old the top as much as possible. But I think in the context of this, given the backgrounds of all the characters, it kind of made sense why they were wild in. If you've ever been around theater people, this seemed on brand to me. Lacey hated it. <laughs> So I think it's one of those things that you're either gonna like or you're really not going to like. And I kind of thought it was fun. Still, I only give this three stars because I thought that the storytelling format was a little loosey goosey at times. Again, if you have not read The Silent Patient or The Maidens, there are major spoilers for those two books in the epilogue, so tread carefully. And watch out for my review of those three books hopefully. All right, we are done with the arcs. So let's get into the rest. This pimple needs its own YouTube channel at this point. I feel like it's just getting more and more noticeable as this video goes on. We're going to just call her Penelope. Penelope the pimple. We're going to start with this collection of short stories. I originally was trying to read that short story collection with Grady Hendrix's Ankle Snatcher and then I got a little distracted as per by this Obsessions collection. Do I recommend? No. I read five of the six because one of them was too I hate using this word, but triggering for me. I don't like to read thrillers about new moms who just Baja blasted a baby into the world. I only like two of them and they were the two lowest rated stories. So the one written by B.A. Paris. At this point, guys, let's just be honest with each other. Sorry, this is going to be really harsh, but um, you didn't actually try. That's, that's not your, that's not your best, right? Like, like you didn't really give your all or even like a quarter or a 10. That was just something that you typed up on your notes app while your husband was taking a dookie or something. Cause just between you and I, like you weren't being serious, right? All that to say, skip this. I still want to read this series. Hopefully it's better because this was an abomination. All right. So moving on from that pleasant discussion, this one, yes. I read it and no, it's not a joke. You can blame Damn It Delaney on Instagram. You know, I've been entering my rom-com era and I've gotten more accustomed to the spice and the doors being wide open. The house is made of glass. I'm good with it. I had asked her for some fake dating wrecks because I'm a super slut for that trope and she recommended this one to me. She's like, oh, this is a great one. It's sports, football, and he gives her lessons. And so I was thinking, oh, he like, he teaches her how to throw a perfect spiral. Like what, what position does he play? And then she's like, no, 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 like lessons. And I was like, 
Gotcha. So no perfect spiral then. Okay, good, good to know. I didn't rate this one because I just, I honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I think for what it is, it's a smutty sports romance. It's, it's fine. She did use the wrong form of there on page six. That threw me for a loop, but uh, it's fine. Like the writing is not any worse than the Coho, the Freedom, the BA Paris, the Nita Pros. The characters have some stuff going on in their backstories. They're pretty flushed out. The spice, like it's the most normal, I would say, of the spice that I've read. It's the least scary. I don't know how this stands up if you're a regular reader of these types of books, but it was fine. So go ahead. I hope you enjoy it. All right, and then the last of my Kindle books is Another Time, Another Place by Joe Levitt. This one started off good, and I would definitely read another book of hers because she's legit funny. It's very Lindsay Kelp adjacent but we got a little carried away in that second half and I've noticed this a lot in books where it feels like there's so much effort and care and time put into that first half of the book by the time they get to the second half they're just over it I'll put this picture of the horse where it's like super detailed and then it was like a three-year-old took over that's kind of the same vibe here and Ben you can come and get these hands elbows knees feet shins all of it. I'll headbutt you if push comes to shove because absolutely the fuck not. If you hate miscommunication, skip this. This was miscommunication on basalt. Old dude literally broke his lease and moved like a three hour train ride away because he just didn't want to tell her why they couldn't be together. And the reason that they couldn't be together was so blasphemous. When you're reading rom-coms, it's for the happy ending. But at this point I was like, I want the most miserable ending of all time for Ben because that's truly what he deserves. He was shooting blanks downstairs and upstairs the way he was acting. Dumbass. Lots of joy and love so far in this video. Now we are going to get into my book stack. I'm going to review these together. They're both Elena Armas books, The Long Game and The Spanish Love Deception. The hate train keeps rolling with this one. And I was excited about this one because it's a sports romance. So she is a Nepo baby who is the comms director of Miami FC, which is a professional soccer team. She gets into a little skerfuffle with the team mascot. So old daddy O sends her off to butt fuck nowhere to redeem herself by helping with a youth soccer team and that's where she meets this guy who's a former professional goalie from England and this cover is kind of funky and I like that unfortunately the fun stops here this had potential definitely but I just couldn't buy into the whole enemies to lovers thing parts of the story were missing or something because we were just jumping from like him going woman dumb me smart woman stupid heels me good footwear to then just being like i'm buying you a whole new wardrobe and cooking you a sick course breakfast i mean i'm not going to say no to a new wardrobe or a breakfast but what happened in between here and then the other issue was the spicy scene so um elena armas I don't want to yuck anyone's yum, but like we need to have a discussion about these dry humping scenes because it was in this one and it was in this one. So I was just hoping it was a one-off because under no circumstances should people in their 30s be dry humping in November in sub-zero temperatures in the forest. Not that there's an appropriate age to do that, but it feels decidedly grosser once you're past your 30s versus maybe like early 20s. I didn't lose my virginity so we can rub the seams of our pants together. And I love my husband and he's banging, but if Pierre looked me dead in the face and said dry hump me, I would literally punch him in the face and then run away screaming stranger danger because that is criminal behavior. Then we got another dry humping scene in here. And this one was actually more confusing to me because he dry humped her in the privacy of his own home. And he said, come for me so then I can smash you better. And I was like, I don't, I think you got the rules reversed there, my brother, because the way that your kind is set up is y'all sometimes need to get a little a little warning shot off before you can show up for the main event. I felt like that was a little bit of boy math because that most certainly isn't girl math. Now, I didn't count how many times certain words were used in this one, but I did in this one, and it's a tragedy. The word chest is used 199 times, and the word heart is used 149 times. And then blue is used 102 times. So first of all, jail. 
And then second of all, you're published by a big publishing house. So where the fuck is the editor? Because there's no way you don't notice. And also she writes like, you know, in college when you're assigned an essay and it's like got a page minimum of six pages or something and you're on page three and you ran out of shit to talk about a page ago. So you just start writing the most elaborate sentences of all time. That's the vibe I was getting in this book. And also Catalina Wine Mixer gave me major Lydia from Love is Blind season five vibes. Once I started picturing Lydia in my head, I was like, game over. All right, another romance book that unfortunately landed itself in two star territory. This one is about a ghost writer who has a horrible one night stand, goes to a meeting the next day with a prospective client and Blue P happens to be the horrible one night stand. She agrees to the job because she needs to pay her bills. While they're on the road, she's like, by the way, that dick game was whack as fuck and you should just stop torturing women and become celibate. He's shook, but then they come to the agreement where she's going to teach him how to be better in bed, kind of like the blind side. If you are interested in that whole lessons trope, definitely just go with the blind side. At one point she legitimately busts out the anatomy charts. I wouldn't have been surprised if she pulled out that American Girl puberty book to, to give him some fun facts. Also there was unfortunately a dry humping scene in an alleyway. But other than that, the middle section of this book took 10 years off my life. These two bozos were the type that just talked at each other and not to each other. There was no playful banter to kind of get the chemistry going, especially after your first impression of this guy is that he couldn't find the clitoris without a map, quite literally since you did bring out the map later. And then to somehow reboot that attraction, you're like, let's talk about the most depressing shit known to mankind. What is the worst trauma you went through? He was like, I've got severe OCD and I used to hide food from my parents and my dad was whooping my ass. Instead of just being empathetic to a situation, she's like, I totally get it. I have generalized anxiety disorder. I wish I was kidding, but that legitimately was her response. That's literally like if somebody told you about how they grew up in refugee camps and your response was, yeah, oh my God, I know what you mean. Every time I go camping, it's so uncomfortable. Touch grass in the middle of the highway. Because what the fuck is that? This also felt like she had a list of hot button social issues that she wanted to touch on. She goes back and forth between, I gotta stop sucking him off. I need to be professional. Call me Elle Woods. Then she goes out to old man. She's like, I gotta tell you about my abortion because it's part of my past and I can never let men into my life unless I know about my abortion. I'm sorry, did you not just say that you want to keep everything profesh to death? So then she goes on her whole like pro-choice rant and sums it up by saying, I don't even think about it that much. So then why the fuck would you tell your boss that? Even if my boss sat here and said, I will literally bump up your salary to 200 grand if you tell me the story of your abortion, I would be like, I'll stay broke, thanks. Wh why, why? Why? I'll end on a positive note that the writing was much better than the X talk, which I DNF'd because it was abysmal. Do I recommend? Absolutely fucking not. You again, look at the fall vibes on this cover. I like it. It's very, very contemporary. You've got all types of gender and sexuality representation, different types of relationships, all types of things. I absolutely love the banter between the two. It was legitimately funny. I thought the character growth of Josh was phenomenal. He starts off pretty much as a carbon copy of Schmidt from New Girl and then just really gets his shit together by the end. She takes way too long to get there. But then we got to the second half and it was like, y'all wanna see some depression? I got you. Because it was straight up turmoil. But I definitely wanna check out whatever else she has coming out next because the jokes were flowing and the writing was quite good. So do I recommend? Yes-ish, but honestly it could go either way for you. All right, Wildfire. I have not read Icebreaker, so I cannot compare. I had seen this all over TikTok and I kind of wanted to see what she was about, but Icebreaker is like 600 pages. I'm not doing that under no circumstances. Hannah Grace describes herself as a fluffy comfort book author. So that's how I reviewed this book, hence the three stars. Although when you really deep it, it's not so fluffy. These two give my daddy issues a run for their money their backstories are very serious especially his it's like alcoholism gambling drunk driving all types of shit like that so the fluff is distinctively flat at that point also if you're looking for like a slow burn it's not in here this was hot water on demand literally she's having three orgasms within the first 10 percent of the book tangent alert but in big old 2023 can we stop pretending that during your 
first time with an absolute stranger, you're going to cross the finish line three times. The jig is up. But yeah, this was whatever to me. Yes, the writing is extremely basic, but it wasn't the worst book I had read. But this is not a must add to the roster is what I'm trying to say. Now this, this, Emily Henry, you little minx, you fucking got my ass again. This one is about Harriet and Wynne. They have broken up on the low skis. They didn't tell their friends. That puts them in a little bit of a sticky situation when they find themselves at their rich friend's cabin in Maine where they have to pretend to be together because they don't want to ruin the vibe there. It's one last hurrah. Their two friends are getting married. They're selling the cabin. So they just don't want to be a bunch of Debbie Downers. If you're a Beach Reed stan, you need to get into this, okay? Beach Reed was one of the first romances I had read in over a decade and I didn't really have any expectations going in but did I find myself silent crying under my sheets at 1am? You bet I did. And this book definitely brought me to the same place emotionally as Beach Read. Now disclaimer I was on days one and two of my period so that definitely could have affected how much I adored this book but it just made a hoe feel all the things. And she writes family, I'm not gonna say drama really but just like family dynamics dynamics and relationships in a way that just speaks to my broken soul. And as we got closer to the end and shit was still turbulent between Harriet and Wynne and I was going, don't you dare Nick and Jess, new girl season three me. Don't you dare Emily, don't you fucking dare. My husband was downstairs in the gym blast and trapped clean by Fetty Wap. And even Fetty Wap couldn't distract me from getting emotional. And that's when you know you're down bad because it's impossible to be emotional while listening to Fetty Wap. The only emotion I ever feel is annoyed because he fucking sucked. It's definitely one of my favorite reads of the month and I am really looking forward to her next one. This was a redemption book because after I read Still See You Everywhere, I was like, is this how she's always been writing and I was just blind to it or was this exceptionally shit? So then I picked this one up and I was like, no, 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 this is how Lisa Garner writes. It was definitely more of a typical police procedural. I'm gonna give it a four star. I was definitely going like Stevie Wonder to some situations like the cheese tracker guy who was just bopping around doing all types of shit that he definitely should not be allowed to do 13 year old Sharla being in police briefing tossing out theories and everybody actually listening to her like that yeah but then it just I had to open my eyes at some point and the final showdown with a grown ass criminal confessing all his sins to a 13 year old. It was too much for me to recover from because not even Scooby Doo would go down like that. How are you just gonna stand there and get bamboozled by a teenager and then just be breaking the whole crime down from A to Z? Like who cares? You've got a gun, man, do something, use it. That's fucked up to say, but what are we doing? Are we in Hamlet? Chill with the soliloquies and just get on with it, brother. Lots of negativity in this and I apologize, but we're gonna end on an extremely high note. The Bodyguard by Catherine Center. The easiest five stars I've tossed this year by far, a banger. I absolutely love this and I'm kicking myself for not reading it earlier. Now, if you watched my physical TBR video, you may have heard what this is about. Essentially, she is a bodyguard or executive protection agent who's assigned to protect Jack Stapleton. He's a famous actor who's in town because his mother is ill. This like beach read, it made me feel all the things. This is a clean romance. There's like two kissing scenes, I think, but you won't see the word clit and there's definitely no dry humping. Thank God. This was hilarious. I love an out of pocket nickname. So the whole stumps slash stumpy thing had me laughing out loud. The supporting cast actually added to the story. I love their banter. I wish there had been more of it. Like I only have great things to say about this book. I powered through it in an afternoon. It was amazing and I would love love to see it as a movie. If you love Lindsay Kelk, you will absolutely love this. It's like the same type of vibe. The jokes were just fantastic. I love the unique angle of her being a protection agent. She actually did her research if you read the author's note. It added a unique spin on your typical fake dating kind of forced proximity one bed trope. I also liked that his like trauma in his life revolved around his family versus the whole oh, I'm a celebrity and nobody sees me from me and I'm, I'm tired of everybody saying that they want to lick me from crack to sack. Oh it's so hard being rich. I actually kind of humanized him with some legitimately traumatizing shit. All in all, a banger. I highly recommend. Super, super fun. A great end to my month.
All right, guys, my throat is sore. I am absolutely parched and I just felt one single drop of sweat run down my spine. Thankfully, we have reached the end. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. Please let me know below what was your favorite and least favorite book of the month, your Deserted Island books, and if any of these books that I talked about are on your radar or just share your love or hate for them if you've read them. I think that's all I have to say. So thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time. Bye!